to the topic of time maltreatment, I want to introduce you to the concept of violence against children because UN agencies like WHO, UNICEF are now talking more and more about violence against children. And they are also talking about the fact that violence can impact on the fetus before birth and then on the child. And that impact will have consequences of the on the family and the community at large. So um, what is violence against children? What do we mean by it? It, include, it includes all forms of violence against children under 18 years old perpetrated by parents or caregivers, peers, older children, romantic partners, or strangers. And I talked about the fetus being affected. Uh, if there is intimate partner violence in the home, if there is domestic violence when the mother is pregnant, we know now that there there will be intrauterine growth retardation. More and more evidence is now, now coming out in addition that it affects the growth of the fetal brain and is now thought to be associated with behavioral problems later on in childhood. So this violence starts even before birth. Violence against children we talk of even before birth now. We also talk about this transgenerational transmission of violence. That is, if a child grows up in a violent household, uh, he or she, when he or she grows up, will then perpetuate this cycle of violence because that is all she or he has known. So if he or she was hit for corporal, pun corporal punishment was used at home, then that is going to be the next generation is also going to be impacted by that. So we talk about transgeneration transmission of violence. The WHO talks now about six main types of violence that tends to occur at different stages in a child's development. Let's look at it. This is in 2016, the WHO came up with this. So on the top, you have under five years to 18 plus. In there, from zero to 17 years, we talk about child maltreatment. Uh, it is the same as child abuse and neglect. If you need read different journals, you'll find different terminology. It is the same as child abuse and neglect. So from zero to 17 years, we talk about child maltreatment. Bullying can happen at any point in time, preschool to 18 plus. Youth violence. Intimate partner violence in adolescence, sexual violence, emotional or psychological violence, and witnessing violence right throughout from uh, very small days to 18 plus. So these are the uh, six types of violence um, the WHO talks about in violence against children. Right. So Abbott, I just wanted to show you that from time to time, I will be uh, going to violence against children, but uh, we will uh, stick to our topic, which is child maltreatment. In 1999, the WHO uh, defined child maltreatment. Uh, and I will read this sentence, which is a very long sentence. It constitutes all forms of physical and or emotional ill treatment, sexual abuse, neglect or negligence treatment, or commercial or other exploitation, resulting in actual or potential harm to the child's health, survival, development, or dignity. For me, the last bits in red is the most important in the context of a relationship of responsibility, trust, or power. So child maltreatment in that in that overall violence against children is is a category where adults usually older older uh, in adults either parents or caregivers would inflict sex, physical or sexual abuse or neglect and the status part is it is in the relationship of responsibility trust and power I'm sure you know this but I thought I'll have to. Uh, for completeness sake, do this, okay? So there are several types of abuse and neglect or maltreatment. We talk about physical, sexual, emotional. We talk about neglect. 
then we talk about exploitation and under exploitation we talk about child labor conscription of children to armies uh, uh, for war situ in war situations intentional drugging and poisoning and munchausen syndrome by proxy those all come under exploitation and now we are recognizing this prenatal violence against children also as a form of maltreatment what is the size of the problem in the usa there are said to be 2000 deaths per year due to child maltreatment not because of pneumonia or meningitis or a road traffic accident but intentional injury child abuse or neglect or child maltreatment uk smaller country 400 deaths per year what is the situation in sri lanka let's have a look these are uh, cases of uh, reported cases reported to the women's and children's bureau of the sri lanka police this data is from 2015 to 20 sorry 2010 to 2015 you may think it's a bit outdated but i put it because the increasing trend in reporting if you go through the numbers the total the police uh, report these or uh, take these, uh, they, they classify these uh, crimes as grave crimes and minor crimes. And to, if, just to update you, in 2017, there were 8,548 reported cases. And in 2020, up to July, so January to July, 5,242. I do not have the rest of the figures to complete this, but that shows that by the end of uh, uh, 2020, uh, we would have had maybe 10,000. So there is an increasing trend. Me, uh, I am happy about this. Some of you will say why. Well, because the stories are finally coming out. There are, for each one of these children, there are thousands of others who are shedding silent tears without their stories being heard. And those are the ones we pediatricians have to reach out to. So we have to now be responsible in our response to child abuse and neglect. When a child comes into the hospital, we need to sort things out uh, for them uh, in a satisfactory manner where they are, they are able to heal from the trauma they have gone through. So um, just to uh, show you, uh, if you look at the top, these are grave crimes reported to the police in those years, murders up on top. And in red, I have, I, it's a very clouded slide. I don't follow this, but I just want to show you. I have highlighted in red, rape, procuration, grave sexual abuse, and incest. Those are the higher numbers. These are the sexual uh, abuses that we see in children. Procuration means abducting for sexual purposes. Even in minor crimes, sexual harassment and obscene publications, if you put those together, far outweigh the other types of abuse we see in children. Let's look at some hospital-based data. This is from a cohort of 920 children that I have seen from 1993 in Gaul. Up to 2020 July, uh, I have not completed the data analysis after July. And this is what we see. So it corroborates with the police data. We see sexual abuse much higher than all other types of abuse. And who abused them? In 96% of children, it was a known trusted person who abused them. So this is why this problem is such a horrible thing for children, and that is why we pediatricians have to do something about it. So I will quickly go through this because all of you know this. Physical abuse is intentional use of force against the child that results in harm to child's health, survival, development, or dignity. It can include anything from hitting to suffocating to burning, whatever. And why is this done? Sometimes with really the intent of harming the child, and as you know, often with the object of disciplining children. So we have to address this issue. Uh, here is a child, intentional use of uh, physical abuse for hurting a, a, the child. Little girl who arrived in our ward, must be 15 years ago. 
matted hair, dirty, unkempt layers of dirt on her, and looked at the various injuries, bite marks, burns, abrasions, uh, cane marks, healed uh, abrasions. So this is the life for some children. If I remove the cover that I have put against her eyes, you would notice the frozen watchfulness that we refer to, where she is looking at us as if, are you going to hit me too? She's awaiting, you know, she's almost anticipating that we would do that. So she's on her way to the for a bath when she came to our ward. She's doing well now. So, but this is uh, the situation with intentional hurting of a child with physical abuse. Here are some pictures of corporal punishment at home. The first, sorry, these, uh, these marks with the arrows. This is a single mother struggling with two young girls. And every time they do something wrong, she uses intense incense sticks to burn the children. And these are the burn marks that you see. So we talk about cigarette burns that these little girls um, shows and assaulted by the mother's partner, uh, the buckle mark is there. Dinushka, can I, uh, does my point work? Uh, yeah, madam, nah. it's working. If you can click on the right, then you will right click on the mouse, then you will see option called uh, laser pointer. That would be much easier, madam. Can you see my arrow now? Yeah, I can see. Ah, I can okay. See. So, so this is the buckle of the belt that this little two and a half girl was assaulted uh, with. And this is a cigarette burn. This is a heated fork on the face of this child by the father. This is a rice cooker wire uh, for assault of a girl, young girl. So this is corporal punishment at home. And this is corporal punishment in schools. So I, I know all of you are aware of the recent social reports of fighting, of caning, and we have banned corporal punishment in schools in 2001, but as you know, it is rampantly ignored, the circulars are ignored. These are all, uh, most of these are after 2001. Uh, this girl, child at the top right could have lost the sight of his eye uh, because of the assault he suffered in school by a teacher, a cricket coach, actually. Uh, so, um, we are now through the college pushing for banning corporal punishment. We have to do more, uh, not only in schools, but in the homes as well. We'll have to do something, otherwise we are losing lives and causing uh, injury and hurt. And the main thing is some most of these injuries have now faded, but what is left behind are the psychological scars, which we cannot erase. Uh, unless we make a major attempt. So this is physical abuse. And then we have to talk about the emotional and psychological maltreatment. Blaming, shaming, routine labeling and humiliating. You are a fool, you are worthless, you are bad, whatever. Negative comparisons. Your brother is getting 90 marks in maths. Why can't you? Please don't uh, allow parents to compare children. They are, have different talents, and everyone does not have to get 90 marks in mathematics. Frequent yelling, threatening, or bullying, uh, of course, affects the mental health and social development of the child and leaves lifelong scars. Sometimes emotional and psychological maltreatment is not picked up, and it leaves huge psychological scars behind. The other important thing is. Uh, that a lot of parents need to know gender-based and domestic violence in young children when they witness this when they hear this that's a huge issue for children this little uh, child is listening to this conversation this, this argument heated argument between the parents these brains are like little sponges it's uh, absor absorbing everything and it leaves huge scars behind so uh, we need to um, uh, talk to parents about this, uh, uh, tell them that this is, these are things that they should not be doing. What about child labor under exploitation? I hope all of you know that now uh, no child can be employed until he's 16 years of age. Earlier it was 14. 
Recently, we increased compulsory to 16, so it follows that no child, uh, uh, it has been altered. Uh, the labor laws, no child under 16 years can be employed. And even after 16 years, employment cannot be with dangerous things like electric work or digging things or anything like that. So we have strict laws. Uh, what we see in Sri Lanka are not some of these pictures. These are not from Sri Lanka. This is from our neighboring countries. We don't see so much of this, but what we see is domestic labor. Uh, you can do a lot if uh, you get a child who's a domestic, uh, who's been uh, employed as a domestic laborer. Uh, uh, neighbors are now ringing and informing the police. So we are getting more and more children coming in and compensation is done and uh, imprisonment is done for people who have um, taken these children as child laborers. So the laws are there. We pediatricians have to do something about this. Um, ex under exploitation, intentional drugging and poisoning is something uh, we see. These are three brothers who were seriously ill after they consumed their morning milk one morning when they woke up, getting ready to go to school. The eldest ended up in the ICU in a close by hospital and they struggled to save him but of course he survived and he's doing very well the younger two also fell sick and there was poison in their milk who poisoned them it's the mother now we talk about transgenerational transmission of violence i'm trying to depict the mothers um, when you look at the story behind the story uh, these three children's mother did not have the warmth of her mother when she was growing up because her mother went overseas to find employment. Their mother, the little girl in this picture, grew up in different relatives' houses and she never felt she was, uh, you know, she never felt wanted there. She went from house to house and uh, she did not really uh, think uh, that she was being taken care of. Then she ran away with a man at a very young age and produced these three beautiful children, then realized she can't live with that man anymore, came back to her mother who was now back in Sri Lanka, and she then developed a relationship with a young boy. And uh, obviously for her, these three children were too, much, too many for her life. So she decides to poison them. She disappeared. The police has not found her. But these three children are doing beautifully well with the grandmother. We have done a family strengthening program for them and we see them regularly. They are doing very well. So this is what we have to break this cycle of abuse which will go from generation to generation. Abuse and neglect. Here is neglect. A little child who was transferred to Gaul when I was there. Severe failure to thrive, cane marks, burn marks, injury to the nasal septum from which she was bleeding. So this is gross neglect. Um, right, let's get to child sexual abuse and sexual exploitation. I have put two pictures of two of our children. This is a young boy and this is a young girl who is pregnant, physically and sexually abused and pregnant. This is a young boy who had been gang raped two years before on a playing field. And two years later, he came to us with a human papilloma virus infection. Uh, when he told his mother about the problem, she didn't do anything. She said, OK, that's fine. And only when he came uh, to the ST clinic with the human papilloma virus infection, we were able to help him. So um, I will talk about this again, the gender difference in child sexual abuse in Sri Lanka. Uh, so child sexual abuse, again, we'll go through this pretty quickly. Involvement of dependent, developmentally mature children and adolescents in sexual activities, which they do not truly understand, to which they cannot give informed consent, which violates accepted social norms and which are against the law. So uh, how does an eight-year-old know what is happening to her body? How can she give consent? She does not understand and it accepts, uh, it violates all accepted social norms. So, um, 
and again it is between a child and an adult or another child who by age or development is in a response in a relationship of responsibility trust and power so we have 17 year old boys abusing uh, 12 year old girls so this again becomes child sexual abuse because uh, th that child is uh, in a responsibility in a position of responsibility trust and power because of the age uh, and the tender age of the younger child he is abusing so again you know that child sexual abuse can divide can be divided into physical uh, touch and non touch where physical activity takes place penetrative intercourse anal sex touching and fondling of genitalia or where there is no touch exposure to perpetrator's genitalia exposure to blue films and the internet and world wide web are being used now to attract children to prostitution pornography and various other factors so um just a quick run through about the demographic characteristics of children who have faced sexual abuse in our cohort we had 83% females and 17% males you can see the age ranges uh and um, 10 to 17 for boys and girls was the higher age the youngest girl was 18 months she required um a colostomy because her whole uh, genitalia were torn her anus was torn she needed a colostomy and reconstructive surgery um the youngest boy is 3 years uh, and the oldest is 17 a little word on child sexual exploitation because i think you need to know about this female genital mutilation is a form of exploitation and uh, it produce uh, and it is happening in sri lanka in certain communities there are no health benefits unlike male circumcision and this was banned 2 uh, years ago no health, uh, no medical uh, no doctor can carry out female genital mutilation in this country anymore don't know whether to stop the problem it won't there are other answers we have to find but uh, so female genital mutilation is a form of child sexual exploitation trafficking of children for sexual purposes prostitution grooming i talk about grooming later and intimate partner violence this sexual exploitation can also happen online exposure pornography grooming sex motion live sexual abuse and sexting last one year where our children are learning online we have had a lot of children who have got caught to online sexual exploitation and huge problems because the parents are unaware they do not know what's happening sometimes when the children are online and children have got caught and uh, led to huge problems so i think these are issues we need to talk to parents about we talk about a grooming process in child sexual abuse this could happen as i said on person or in person or online it's a process of identifying and en and engaging a child in sexual activity it involves an imbalance of power and a motivation and intent to sexually exploit the child there are six stages we talk about starting from targeting the victim gaining the victim's trust filling the child's unmet need isolating the child sexualizing the relationship and maintaining control i'll give a little example we've had several of these i'll give an example an 8 year old girl a, a relative a male relative comes to live with them and from the beginning he made her feel special the parents did not have a lot of money so every day he would bring her back something something small to make her feel uh, that she is special uh, so gaining the victim's trust telling her that she is special then he started isolating the child and then sexualizing the relationship and then telling the child this is our little secret please don't tell your parents what's happening because i will kill your mother or father or you if you go and tell so that is the main meaning of control so this is grooming if any child is getting special attention from an adult uh, i think the parents should uh, be aware of this and keep an eye on the situation we have also had uh, what we call uh, sex torsion this is blackmail by using sexual information or images which are used to extort sexual favors 
and all money from the victim and also from friends or family of victim. It has two components, the sexual component and the corruption component. In the last year, two, 18 months or so, we have had 10 adolescents uh, facing this situation. I will just give you one example. 14-year-old boy was forced to have oral sex with an 18-year-old boy. The 18-year-old videoed the act unknown to the 14-year-old. And he started blackmailing the 14-year-old. The, um, the boy had to uh, steal the jewelry and money of her, his family and give it to the perpetrator. And otherwise, he was going to put the video on the net and share it with all the friends. So the mother found her jewelry missing and then found out what was happening and, um, and the problems were sorted out. Uh, so there are uh, the police can deal with them. Uh, the law is has to be amended, but the police are able to. Not all police stations know about how to deal with it, but there are higher police officers who know what to do. So this is uh, something again. Adolescents are getting caught up in. We are also seeing intimate partner violence or dating violence. A little girl of 14 whose arm was cut and her hair was also cut by her uh, supposed to be boyfriend. Uh, so these are also issues for adolescents. I talked about the boy child and the girl child. I want to just very quickly touch on the gender difference in child sexual abuse. Uh, as I showed you, the hospital-based cohort, we have seven, we had at that time 15, 17% and 83% girls and boys, a higher number of girls. This has not changed, 85, 15, that kind of thing we get. But when you do community studies, this is from a uh, juvenile victimization uh, study we did in the university students uh, of the faculty, uh, of the Caronia campus. 1,300, we found that 54% of boys said that they had been sexually abused as children, and 46%. So this is not the only study. There's a, a study by Professor Harindra De Silva. Again, he showed that boys were more affected. And there was a, another study by Kia International, where they, where, where they talk to men uh, adult men, and 27.7% of those revealed that they had been sexually abused when they were children. So these boys, as you can see from the hospital-based cohort, are not brought into the system. I told you that little boy who had the human papilloma virus infection told his mother that he had been gang raped in a, in a playing field, but she took no notice. Why? Because there is no issue of virginity and there is no issue of pregnancy. So these boys are not brought into the system. Are they perpetuating the cycle of abuse because there is no rehabilitation happening? I'm convinced this is happening in Sri Lanka. And we need to talk about this more and more, about the male child who has been sexually abused. Okay, what about the impact? Uh, obviously, sexually transmitted infections. 36 pregnancies we have seen, six miscarriages or children having children. Uh, psychological disturbances, attempted suicide, deliberate self-harm. We see a lot of hands like this, forearms, where deliberate self-harm, cutting themselves because they are so stressed out. We had a 15-year-old girl hanging herself. We felt very bad about this. She was supposed to be counseled. This is before our child protection unit started. And this is one reason we opened the child protection unit at Ragama, because we felt very bad about this little girl who went to a child development center. And uh, she had no relatives at all. That's why she went there. And she hung herself and died. Uh, so this is the impact on children. Uh, we've had uh, this little girl is no more. She, this was very badly managed. A little girl with a fracture femur who was brought in, illegally adopted by parents. And uh, the police officer discharged her from Ragama, from the ward she was in. We did not have the child protection unit then. 
and uh, the magistrate was not told about the fracture. You can see the spiral fracture in her femur. And uh, he only talked about the illegal adoption, which he said was going needed to be sorted out. A few weeks later, she ended up in another hospital, shaken baby syndrome and death. So this is the issue of uh, of uh, child maltreatment unless we we all get together and do something about it. What about the impact of the family? I showed you that picture, family and uh, com the whole community. We've had homicides, suicides among family members, stigma of the problem leading to divorce and separation of parents, depression among siblings. So this, this is the whole issue about this problem. This is lifelong suffering sometimes. Who are the children at risk? The WHO divides this to uh, characteristics in the parent and caregiver, and I have done the same with our data. We see a lot of dysfunctional families because mothers are employed abroad, parents are either separated or divorced. In our data, of those sexually abused, only 51% of children were living with both parents at the time of the incident. I think this is very sad. And 15% of mothers were employed overseas in those sexually abused children at the time of the incident. We've seen psychiatric illnesses. We have seen alcoholism and drug, drug addiction. This is a huge problem increasing day by day. These two little boys are both eight years old. They are on their way out of our child protection unit with the police officer who's taking them to courts to a CDC. In one boy, they were uncle and nephew, actually, the relationship. They were living with a drug addicted young adult female because they are, uh, both, uh, in one child, both parents were in prison for drug related crimes, and in the other child, the father was in prison for a drug related crime. They were living in this unprotected environment. They came home after school and drank what they thought was Sprite. It was laced with ice, amphetamine. So they, was, they were admitted to hospital and um, there was no one in the world to take care of them. So we had to send them to a child development center through courts. This is a lot of examples of drugs causing problems right now to children. Chronic illnesses in parents, poor parenting skills, lack of emotional bonding between children and parents, lack of extended family support are all issues uh, of uh, uh, putting children at risk. What about the children themselves, the individual level? Um, children, we have seen, we are seeing this over and over again, children with learning disabilities and differently abled children. We had noticed this and we started doing uh, the test of nonverbal intelligence, Tony 3. Uh, in the 119 children we had done this on, 52.9% had an IQ below average or lower. And 18% of children were diagnosed to have specific learning disorder, whereas the, pro uh, the prevalence in the population is 5 to 10%. This is very worrying. And some of these children were 15 years old, they could hardly do year grade three work, but they were in the appropriate class for their age, just going on from year to year with no help sought from either the, by the teachers or the parents. So they get caught, they are not focused in school, they get caught, they run away with someone who promises them the earth and they get into trouble. So the other factors the WHO has uh, outlined are being under four years old or an adolescent. I have highlighted the adolescent because that is what we are seeing more and more. Being unwanted or failing to fulfill the expectations of parents. This is happening with schooling, for example. Children are assaulted, not realizing that they, they are not capable of doing the studying they're supposed to do because their IQ is below average or very poor. Uh, WHO also talks about being identified as a lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender as a respect. They also talk about community level and societal level factors, and all of these are true in our children that we see, lack of adequate housing, unemployment, 
alcohol and drugs we have already alluded to, inadequate policies and programs to prevent mal child maltreatment, child pornography, child prostitution, and child labor. And I think this other one, social cultural norms that promote or glorify violence towards others. We see this on the TV every day. Give, uh, this example is given by the very high up people in the country. So what do you expect the children to do? They see this violence, they see violence on TV, they see violent films on TV, and it becomes a norm. So, okay, I have said a lot. Let's talk about management of child abuse and neglect. Uh, the first aspect of managing a child who has been abused or neglect or maltreated, as it were, is to recognize the problem. Otherwise, you have let that child down. So we who work with children and all medical professionals, teachers, preschool teachers who work with children should be able to recognize this problem. An appropriate reference should happen. So let's quickly go through the warning signs in the history that we should be aware of. Delayed presentation for medical treatment. A child's arm is fractured because of an intentional injury. They delay coming. They wait because they are guilty. They come very late. So delayed presentation. When they finally can't bear it anymore, they come. Incompatible history with the injuries seen. Here is a little girl who had multiple injuries. She needed blood. She had skull fractures. She had a forearm fracture. Uh, internal injuries and uh, the mother came and said that she fell off a wall which was three feet high. Now if we accepted the story then this child uh, we would not have recognized intentional injuries in this child. So always if you have an incompatible history with injuries seen please be suspicious. History incompatible with the developmental age of the child, changing history from time to time Sometimes the mother says, no, 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 what I said was wrong. That is not what happened. He fell off two steps and not three. Or he fell off uh, uh, the bicycle. So she changes things from time to time. We have to note all this in the BHT and be suspicious of what is happening. Deteriorating school performance. If a girl is being abused by her father at home, how can she concentrate in school? We've seen pseudo seizures, abdominal pains, and headaches. That little girl who committed suicide actually came to our ward with pseudo seizures. We settled her, we counseled her, we handed her over. Our follow up then was not that as good as we do now, sadly, but she was supposed to be getting counseling uh, in the home where she was. Uh, but sadly, she ended up uh, uh, hanging herself committing suicide. So attempt suicide, sexualized behavior. We see this in younger girls who are sexual or, and boys who are sexually abused at a young age. They tend to show sexualized behavior. If you have a girl with a vaginal discharge, especially with blood stain or purulent, please think about sexual abuse. If you have a foreign body in the vagina, please think about sexual abuse. Little girls do not know that there is an orifice there unless they have, they've been made aware of to put foreign bodies in. Uh, warning signs on examination. If you notice the associated neglect, like the one I showed you that arrived in our ward, you have to be suspicious. Depressed mood, no eye-to-eye -eye contact, or on the other hand, very aggressive behavior. We call that internalizing and inter externalizing the trauma. Sometimes depressed mood, they are internalizing their trauma. When they're aggressive, they're externalizing their trauma. Sometimes aggressive is better than internalizing because we can pick up better and help that child. So we talk about internalization of the trauma and external features of externalization. Uh, obviously, multiple injuries of different stages of healing. That little girl had enough to show you that story. This is a picture story, actually, if you want, because different injuries of different stages of healing on one little body. Uh, unusual injuries, 
bone injuries that are seen in association with physical abuse. Uh, here we are, six weeks old with a spiral fracture of the femur, went to a very, went to a very big hospital and was sent home with a back slab saying that this injury will heal very quickly as his bones will grow very quickly. We picked it up in our ward, illegally adopted child, twisting force that caused the, uh, the spiral fracture. Please don't miss these. So spiral fractures of long bones under one is, uh, is uh, due to uh, twisting forces intentionally into the spiral fracture. I don't know whether you can see it. Pulling forces can cause this bucket handle fractures, uh, injuries where the, the, a, a bit of the bone is pulled out of the main bone. I don't know whether it's visible. This is a bucket handle fracture. And the other fracture we talk about is the chip fracture or the corner fracture, again, pulling forces of young bones. So please, if you see this. So some of us pediatricians had seen enough of this. And in the college, we formed a child protection committee and we started developing a program for creating safe communities for children. This happened in 2012. It was a project for the protection of children from abuse, exploitation, violence, and neglect. We talked about better management because we felt our response had to be appropriate if we were to get these children to come to us help. And of course, we talked about a prevention program. And by 2013, we were able to come up. So Plan Sri Lanka helped the College of Pediatricians in this whole project. Uh, otherwise, we couldn't have done it. Uh, and by 2013, we were able to come up with a national guideline for the management of child abuse and neglect. We termed it a multi-sectoral approach because a pediatrician alone or a JMO alone or the police officer alone cannot help these children. We have to have multiple sectors getting together to help these children effectively. All high-level secretaries of uh, ministries, education ministry, women's and children's affairs ministry, all came for these meetings. We discussed for about 18 months. We argued, we screamed at each other, but in the end, we came to consensus and developed roles and responsibilities of all stakeholders in the management of child abuse and neglect. The sad part is that we still have not been able to get the health ministry to put this out as a circular at least. All other sectors are waiting for this to happen, to circularize their roles and responsibilities. Hopefully this year something will happen. Uh, so why do we need a guideline? Because we need holistic management of these children with all sectors involved. And we need to maintain uniformity around the country. It should not be dependent. The, the services such a child gets should not be dependent on where she goes. It should be happening from Jaffna to Point Pedro. Anywhere, in any hospital, in any police station, children should have holistic, good management so that they can heal and achieve adulthood without major psychological sequence. So where should this guideline be followed? In health institutions where the consultant pediatrician, specialist in forensic medicine or the consultant JMO and the consultant psychiatrist are available. What are those institutions? Base hospitals, district hospitals, provincial hospitals, and teaching hospitals. And if these specialists are not available in the institution, the child should be transferred or referred to the nearest institution, preferably transferred. Uh, to the nearest institution where these specialists are available. Okay. Patients seen in the private sector who need medical legal examination should be referred to the JMO in the closest government hospital because still JMO services are not uh, seen all over in the private sector. Um, so let's look at a child who has faced maltreatment. We do not call them victims anymore. We call them children who have faced maltreatment or faced violence or abuse or, and neglect. Okay. This child could be coming to us because we could be detecting this child in the health sector. 
many a time we have had children coming with abdominal pain or headache and when we sit down and talk to them they find out that they are being sexually abused they cannot talk about it so some pediatricians or surgeons or whoever obstetricians sometimes pregnancies come in and then only uh, they detect it in the health sector or the other way they come to us is when they are brought to the health sector by the police that is the commoner way they come to us so what are the procedures in child protection when detected by health personnel it could be pediatrician psychiatric surgeon obstetrician whoever any health sector uh, specialty could detect these children they should inform the hospital police post that they are suspicious that this child is a child who is facing abuse or maltreatment the police will will issue a medical legal examination form and with that they will take the child to the judicial medical officer in the hospital uh, and that is the procedure to be followed when detected by health personnel in the health in the health sector if however any of you as a pediatrician is uncertain is this abuse is this not abuse then in the guideline it says you can refer to the jmo for an opinion without issuing the mlef via the police so if the jmo then agrees yes this is uh, i'm also suspicious yes this is uh, child abuse so then you go back and refer to the police the police will issue a mlef and the jmo will do a proper medical legal exam what about children brought by the police the jmo in the government hospital will take a full medical legal history and do a full medical legal examination and at the same time the police are supposed to inform the probation officer of the area that the child lives in any child either with the either in conflict with the law or a witness to a crime or a child who has faced maltreatment the police have to inform the probation officer this is in the children's and young persons ordinance that is the police probation link so that has to happen and if it is not happening we pediatricians should push for it so we then during the formation of this guideline came up with what we call a clinical case conference because before this guideline came up the specialist in forensic medicine or the jmo we see the child refer to the consultant psychiatrist consultant pediatrician i will ask the child what happened i will ask the mother what happened the child sergeant psychiatrist will ask what happened so from the time the child goes to the police we counted about 16 people could ask this child and the mother what happened this we felt was re traumatization and re victimization so we came up with what we call a clinical case conference with the objective of preventing revictimization informing other specialists and planning further management within the health sector we have now gone beyond uh, uh, the 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 guidelines we now get the venerology team also to come if it is a child with sexual abuse Uh, to sit in this clinical case conference because they need information and when the children are referred to the venerology clinic they ask the story once again so they are also sitting with us we have gone beyond guidelines now this clinical case conference happens within 24 hours of the child coming to hospital and uh, these three key specialists and anyone else it could be the obstetrician the surgeon but these three key specialists and in this case of sexual abuse the venerologist meet and the specialist in forensic medicine or the jmo will share the story with the pediatrician and the psychiatrist and the venerologist before we see the child in detail so that is how it works and that i think is how we should do it to reduce the child being asked the story thousand and one time then we have what we call the institutional case conference which is the link to the multisectoral management this is multidisciplinary integration in the health sector that is the clinical case conference 
the institutional case conference is the link to the multi sectoral management the health sector linking with the other sectors who are involved so these are the kinds of participants at uh, our institutional case conferences uh and that the mother the parents and the guardian of the child also will be called in the social work the so community workers the child rights promotion officers the ncpa officers are doing superb work if you guide them they bring wonderful reports for us to make decisions the probation officers are also doing great work but they have a lot of work on their hands and uh, they go to court but the child rights promotion officers and the officers of the national child protection authority are free to walk into houses and talk to uh, people and get information and they give us a lot of information for our decision making process at the institutional case conference what are the objectives we ensure that further victimization does not take place we prevent stigmatization of the child or we try to we ensure safety of child and family sometimes the child is threatened by the perpetrator's relatives and the family is threatened you should always tell them to call the police there is a witness victim protection bill now now and they can be protected we have to use all of this to protect these children and their families we have to ensure that the child continues his her education without interruption sadly a lot of children are kicked out of school because they were uh, they had faced sexual abuse at the hands of a relative for example that cannot be allowed it was no fault of an 8 year old child that she was sexually abused by her uncle the child has to go back to school uh, so we have to look into this and of course for me, for us the most important is a process of psychosocial psychological rehabilitation and reintegration getting them back into society getting them back their childhood and that is what we always try to do our other objective is ensure legal justice with minimal delays i don't know how many of you are aware any of these cases can take up to 10 years to finish the perpetrator is out at large the family is suffering with a court case over their heads uh something has to be done because justice delayed is justice denied uh so but that is the state of affairs um so the recommendations at the institutional case conference in the hospital is submitted to courts by the probation officer in his saw her social inquiry report that goes up to magistrate and the picture on the right is the institutional case conference in our facility uh, where doctors nurses police officers probation officers are there the police officers do not come in uniform when they come to the pediatric wards at ragama because again the child is stigmatized so the police officer is also seated there in civilian clothing we sometimes go on for hours discussing the problems of one child to make this, the decisions under the categories that i have alluded to uh, so so with all this happening we were fortunate to have a facility for child protection at ragama called lama psa and it's we call it the place where abuse ends and healing begins and sri lanka spent the money for this the ministry of health gave the land and since its admission in april 2015 to february 2029 we have 2021 i'm sorry we have had 620 admissions i have not gone out with a loudspeaker and said chen children to ragama hospital children who are abused these are all children who come to ragama hospital so we have an in house facility Uh, of 10 beds we have a video evidence recording studio for recording of evidence to courts uh, we have a room a child friendly room where uh, children are uh, spoken to here is our child psychiatrist talking to a little girl of 4 years with the nurse on the floor this is the child friendly room where they, they are spoken to the team on the right other nurses and the doctors at lama psa we have a demonstrator we have a development officer we have a big team to help the children uh 
Um, and they have their daily routines. They play, they do home gardening, they in do indoor games, they do outdoor activities, they do yoga, and of course, they do their school work. Their school routines are continuous. As I said, they are trying to give them back, back their childhood and get them back into society. Uh, we carefully follow them up when they leave our unit. As I said, that girl should never have died. The, we did not have Lama Piesa then. We were managing these children in, uh, in the pediatric ward. Every child is given a toy as a reminder, a little token. It's usually a teddy bear that there is help for them at any time, day or night. Our telephone line is operative and there is a nurse. They are, of course, in the night and a doctor during their time. So we, we talk to them if they are in trouble, even if they want to talk to us at any time. So careful follow-up by our team of psychiatrists, pediatricians, medical officers, and nurses. And follow-up care in the community by the community work. Just a little bit of what you can do with a committed facility like that. Uh, 15 of our children sat for GC ordinary level examination in 2017 and 13 qualified for advanced level. Two were following vocational training when they, we saw them and was one was a child who delivered a, a, a child herself following abuse by her father. Child was given for adoption. A 12 year old girl raped by a stranger became pregnant. We found her a new school and a new home. She became the band leader and a prefect, and she her position in the first term back in school was 14 out of 40 children. So things can be done if you want to. A 15-year-old boy groomed by a man in the village with alcohol and drugs, sexually abused following the grooming. He himself became an alcoholic and drug addict, and he dropped out of school. We managed to rehabilitate him. He was determined he was not going back to school, but he, we gave him tuition. Our medical students will come and teach, uh, used to come and teach him. He did sit for his uh, uh, O-level exam last year. Uh, he went to a center near our hospital. We changed his center because he could not go back uh, home because he would have gone back to drugs. He achieved, he got five simple passes in the exam. We were thrilled. And now he's waiting to start vocational training in his school because that is now available for advanced level in school. All I'm saying is a multi-sectoral management with a dedicated team can help holistic recovery. The second such facility will be opened in Karapitiya. Well, the, the plans are there to start it in Gaul. And I hope we have urged the ministry to have at least nine such facilities in the nine provinces in the country. I hope our voices will be heard. Uh, what about what we have talked about is secondary prevention, uh, helping the children who have already faced abuse. What about primary prevention? Of course, this is where we have to now put our energies into. But what should we do? We should be empowering families and communities to safeguard their children, to build cohesive families. I don't know how to do that because our families are breaking up every day. This is the major issue children are facing, breaking up because of marital discord, because of drugs, alcohol, crimes being committed, huge issues. Uh, we need to start somewhere. I, as a pediatrician, I really don't know how to build cohesive families, uh, but someone has to take it over and do it. Capacity building of teachers, counselors in schools, safe school environments. For me, capacitating and empowering children on their own safety and protection. We in Sri Lanka always tell children, respect your elders. But. We have to tell them, which is something we have to do. That is cultural, and we have to say that to our children. But if that adult is doing something wrong, then we should be telling the child to let a trusted adult know. And uh, we have to invest in, in, in the future now. Now is the time to do it. We need to start with the children. 
hopefully then we will be building cohesive families in the future. So let's teach the children. So it will not be necessary to teach the adults, is what I say. Where should we touch, start this teaching? We should start the teaching in preschools. We have developed these posters several years ago. They went to all schools, all health institutions. We need to talk to children about good touch, bad touch, how to recognize good touch and bad touch. And what to do if someone is touching them in, an, in a way that makes them feel uncomfortable or ashamed. This should be a regular activity in preschools and schools and then healthy sexual and reproductive health education to adolescents in schools. Many a child who came to us after having a sexual relationship and sometimes after becoming pregnant tell us that they did not know that they could get pregnant from what they did. And the majority, I believe, some, of course, uh, uh, knew and they went ahead, but the majority of these young adolescents did not know. Why did they not know? Because their families and their schools have let them down because they should have been told how to protect themselves against sexual abuse and how to have a, sex, a, a, a romantic relationship. That's fine. You can have a boyfriend, but where to draw the line? Uh, they come with sexually transmitted infections and then they only they know that this could have happened with what they were engaging in with their boyfriends. So we are letting our children down and we need to do something about it as well. Uh, the few Sri Lankan laws and circulars, I won't go through all of this. Uh, you can read it up. Uh, and um, I will end by saying, uh, this is a little picture I um, cut off from a newspaper maybe 20 years ago. This is a little girl going on a protest march with her parents in Brussels. And her little coat has this message. This was after a, lo a lot of children died across Europe. Several, in several countries, there was a gang of perpetrators abducting children, sexually abusing them, starving them, and killing them. They were hidden in attics. And finally, finally, the, all the police forces got together and uh, they cracked it. And this was a protest march. And this little girl has joined her parents. And her little court say, gives this message. This world is a cruel place, not only because of perpetrators of these crimes, but because of those who know of these acts and do nothing about them. I'm urging all of you who are listening to this, please don't be guilty of this crime. Please, please recognize this and do something about it. Our logo at Lama Piasa is our Nil Manel, our national flower. Not because it's our national flower, but children come to us in very muddy circumstances like this little flower that is born in, in mud and blooms out to be a beautiful flower with no mud sticking on any of its petals. We tell the children this, that that is what we expect from them, to bloom like this flower with no mud from what they had experienced before sticking on them. And uh, I will leave you with that saying are you born for your and may you all live long to help the children of this country thank you